Uh, and thanks to all of you guys. Honestly, I don't think Obama has any idea that I exist, but that's cool. Um, so I was really delighted to be invited here today to talk to you about uh, how climate change is affecting the oceans because, as Martha said, I think many really bright people who really care a lot about the environment maybe don't really um, get to learn much about oceans and the benefits that we receive from oceans and uh, how oceans are changing. So um, people depend on healthy oceans. I think we can all think of ways that that is the case. Um, however, oceans are being rapidly depleted and degraded by a number of different factors, including overharvesting, destructive fishing practices, uh, pollution, both from nutrients as well as um, actual marine debris like plastics, uh, issues of habitat destruction and conversion where, for example, mangrove forests are being cleared to make room for shrimp farms or, or other types of conversion like that, or even just for coastal development. Invasive species are a really big problem for oceans just like they are on land. So we're seeing, for example, lionfish that are appearing in even all the way up to North Carolina and even maybe farther north that are having real effects on the ecosystems there. And then uh, the focus of what we're all here today to talk about, climate change, as well as ocean acidification, which we call climate change's equally evil twin for the oceans. So I'm going to walk you through uh, some of those impacts. But before I do, again, to kind of hammer the ho home the point that it's not just climate change operating in a vacuum, it's climate change affecting the other stresses that we already have uh, on oceans and on our planet. So this is an animation that I'm going to show you. Um, that will show uh, global fishing trends through time and basically focus on the colors where white is pre-peak harvest, red is harvest peak, and then pink is after the harvest has reached the peak in that area. And for those of you who can see it, um, on the lower left-hand side of the screen is the year. So this is going to start in 1951, and I'll just um, walk you through it. So you can see um, starting from coastlines around the world where areas reach peak, and then past peak. So we're now at 1970, 1975, 1980, 85, 90, 95, and 1999. So um, it's going to run again. But that, that just shows you, right, that puts it in perspective. And I think a lot of people... Um, when they think about the oceans, they think about this vast space that is relatively untouched by humanity. And, and really, as you can see, that's, that's not the case. We're impacting oceans in numerous ways, many of which um, folks are pretty much unaware of. And it's happening uh, not just in uh, developed nations, but in developing nations, basically all around the world. So uh, on top of this background, we have now climate change is another threat. And so um, if you guys haven't checked out the recently released national climate assessment that came out um, earlier this year, I would highly recommend it. This is what we consider to be kind of the latest, greatest state of knowledge on climate change impacts in the United States. There were hundreds of experts involved, thousands and thousands of participants across the country provided input. Uh, it has a really awesome website. You can link to social media. So uh, please just check it out if you haven't already. Um, so this is an image from the National Climate Assessment showing um, ocean warming. So this is sea surface temperature changes from average. And basically what you can see is if we consider an average um, in the past that the oceans are becoming warmer and they're becoming warmer really rapidly. And um, if you look at this on a map of the United States put into a global context, you can see that change doesn't happen equally everywhere. And I'd say that's another message about climate change that is kind of hard for people to wrap their brains around. So I work on um, policies associated with how people can better prepare for climate change. So we've heard a lot about renewable energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I think, you know, we're now in the state where Climate change is unavoidable. It's happening now. And we need to better prepare for and respond to climate change um, now and into the future. So when folks are trying to plan, it's important for them to understand how their region might be different from another region or similar to another region so that they can better collaborate 
Um, so this is showing uh, increases in temperature. And again, the trend is basically up in many areas, um, down in some, and then it's getting really warm in some areas really rapidly. And uh, this warming has consequences for the critters that live in the ocean, as well as the people that depend on those. So this is just a map showing red hake, which is a type of fish in the Northeast. And um, red is basically where the hake hanging out. And you can see that in the 1960s and 70s, the hake were hanging out kind of off the coast of New Jersey. And as ocean temperatures warm and the fish are moving along with these uh, changes in temperature, um, they're now, you know, north of Massachusetts in some areas. And so this makes it really challenging, right, for both um, the fishers who depend on this for their livelihoods. It makes it hard for natural resource managers to figure out um, where and how to set catch limits because this landscape is shifting. And so, you know, it's important for us to understand and be able to project how these changes are going to continue to happen through time. And in this situation, they're kind of winners and losers, right? If you're hanging out in New Jersey and that's where your family is, you're kind of a loser if you depend on red hake and your hake aren't there anymore. But maybe folks northward now have um, the opportunity to harvest a species that wasn't there. So again, climate change is affecting uh, people in different ways. And when you looked across not just one fish species, but a whole bunch of different stocks, um, 24 out of 36 stocks that were examined in this study were moving northward or deeper. Again, um, as the waters warm, they can't tolerate those really warm temperatures, so they have to continue to move north or into cooler waters. And uh, another consequence of ocean warming is sea level rise, which we've heard a little bit about today. So sea level rise is driven both by the fact that when water warms, it expands. Also, uh, ice is melting, which is making sea level go up. And then there are these local processes, like some areas have land that's sinking, for example, in areas of the Gulf of Mexico, which makes them then particularly vulnerable to increases in sea level. And so, um, again, vulnerability is not equal. So this is a map of the U.S. And when you look, um, areas of green have relatively low vulnerability to sea level rise, and areas in red have relatively high vulnerability to sea level rise. Um, where we are right now, we're kind of a hot spot for sea level rise. And so the Mid-Atlantic and uh, the Gulf of Mexico are particularly vulnerable. And I think some people think of sea level rise as like, why should I care about sea level rise? It's fine right now. I could just move and get out of the way. You know, no big deal, 2100. Um, but we're already seeing sea level rise. And it's not just sea level rise in a vacuum. It's how sea level rise affects coastal flooding in general. So some areas now, like high tide, actually covers roads. So again, this isn't something in the future. It's something that's happening now. Um, and every time that there are storms, the storm surge is worse because of sea level rise. Um, so one thing that we're doing in the government is trying to provide people with tools so that they can better visualize what sea level rise might look like in their community. So we have like little slider tools where you can say, okay, this is what six uh, feet of sea level looks like. And even showing them images of uh, culturally or historically important landmarks or maybe their church or their county hall or whatever. And, you know, it's, I think it's, it's hard for people to um, wrap their brains around concepts that seem abstract, but if they can see an image of their hospital underwater, it really brings it home. And so that's powerful. It's important to be able to connect with people and what they care about when we talk about climate change. Um, another challenge that I briefly mentioned is ocean acidification. This is one that it, it took folks in the scientific community a lot longer to sort of realize was happening. Um, but now we know that it is, and so there's a lot of research going on in this area to better understand uh, how the oceans are getting more acidic, how quickly it's happening, what species are affected, and how. Um, and basically the reason for this is that as we put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, this carbon dioxide is also being absorbed into the ocean. And so it leads to a series of chemical reactions that means a decline in ocean pH. And even relatively small changes in ocean pH can have relatively big effects on the critters that live there. Um, so the, the critters on the left-hand side of this image are some of those that are particularly vulnerable. So if you build shells, 
Um, if you're a coral reef and you need to calcify in order to have structure, you're particularly vulnerable because you're not getting as much of the calcium carbonate that you need. And um, so there's a lot of work now. There's laboratory experiments where they're looking at, for example, clams under different levels of CO2 to see uh, what it means for them. In the Pacific Northwest of the United States, they're already seeing um, in some areas acidifying water that is actually affecting the production of shellfish. So again, it's not just something in the future, it's actually happening now. Um, one cool thing about it is that they're partnering with scientists, the shellfish hatchery there is partnering with scientists and realized that um, those acidified waters come in at certain times of the year or the month based on um, changes in oceanic circulation that are natural. And so they've effect, they've, uh, in their plant, they basically um, can detect now because they have monitoring equipment when that acidified water is coming in and they stop pumping water in and then they resume again um, when the water is less acidic. So they're actually literally adapting in real time to these changes. And I like that example because it shows that you don't just have to like shrug your shoulders and let bad things happen all the time. You can actually actively uh, use that knowledge for your own benefit and even for economic benefits. Uh, another issue, this is not all ocean related, but oceans do affect our weather and climate system and often um, that can have an effect on extreme events. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of scientific study underway into like, which extreme events are likely to get worse under climate change? If an individual event happened, how much uh, worse was it because of climate change? So that's an area of very active scientific research. Um, but I think, you know, the reality is that we in America and really all around the world are vulnerable to extreme events now. So again, when we're talking about preparedness for weather and climate, we can't deny the fact that we could all benefit from being better prepared, even to what we have right now. So this was in 2012. Um, there were 11 individual extreme events that each totaled a uh, billion dollars or greater in damages. And the total um, damages were over $60 billion and 350 deaths. And so this is just showing uh, some of the extreme events. You know, this year we're seeing really bad drought, wildfires. Um, so it's just something to think about, you know, how are we vulnerable now and how might climate change make that worse? And I talked a little bit about sea level rise and coastal flooding. Uh, these are aerial images from Superstorm Sandy. And uh, this shows New Jersey. So um, the image on the left shows what it was like before. And on the right, you can see all the sand scour, loss of properties. Um, and again, uh, storm surge was worse in Sandy. For example, in New York City, it's already risen a foot. So it was that much worse in part because sea level has already risen. And we can imagine as sea level continues to rise, how much worse the damage might be due to storm surge from any individual event. Um, one thing that we're trying to do right now is to raise people's awareness to vulnerability to st uh, storm surge and flooding and also think about uh, different options. So it's, I know we have some engineers here. In addition to the kind of traditional approaches that people might think of like seawalls, um, or other approaches, thinking about how we can leverage uh, natural systems like marshes and sand dunes and invest in restoration and conservation of those uh, habitats that also provide natural buffering to adjacent coastal communities. So thinking about, I know we've talked a lot about um, economics today. I think that a lot of the um, challenges are that we don't have as, as rigorous of an ability to measure the many benefits that we get from natural systems um, like we do for some more gray infrastructure approaches. So, you know, how can we holistically um, assign value to these different types of approaches that more accurately reflect the multiple benefits that we're receiving? Um, and like I said before, it's not climate change operating in a vacuum. It's climate change on top of other stresses that we're facing and other changes uh, around our planet. So. Uh, this is another figure from the U.S. National Climate Assessment that doesn't have any climate information on it, but it just shows you where people are moving and how populations are changing in the United States in coastal watershed counties. And so if you look at this, um, this is the number of people increasing in number of people between 1970 and 2010. And the bluer uh, are increases and the yellow are decreases. Basically, the only area where people, where there's lower population is around the Great Lakes. Um, and there are some areas like South Florida 
and Southern California where there's been tremendous population growth in recent years. And if we think about this, these are also some of the most vulnerable areas. They're coastal areas. South Florida is already having saltwater intrusion into drinking water, for example. So thinking about how we can work within um, these shifting uh, landscapes of where people are living in the United States. And I would also note, um, people are also moving to the deserts. So from a climate resilience perspective, it's not particularly smart that we as humans are moving to the most vulnerable areas of the country, but it is what it is. There are reasons that we do that. We like it where it's warm. We like the beach. So, you know, again, we have to kind of work within the reality of, of the situation that we're in here. And a lot of this is communicating and reminding people of the benefits that we receive from healthy oceans. So we receive um, buffering, we have opportunities for recreation and employment, tourism depends on healthy oceans, uh, we need biodiversity, we need habitat for fish that we'll later want to eat. We have sites for cultural heritage that if they're lost, we lose those important traditions. So uh, again, all of these things have economic, social, and environmental benefits that are really important um, for us to be paying attention to. So if you're a, an island nation that depends on healthy coral reefs for your economy, both for fishing and for tourism, and the corals go away, uh, you know, you, you lose that sense of identity and you lose that revenue as well. So with all these changes underway, what we're hearing is that folks on the ground, citizens, decision makers, mayors, others um, want to know what's going to happen. So they want to know what's happening now, what's going to happen in the future, uh, how are they at risk, and what can they do? So they, we are really hearing a lot of interest right now in um, people wanting to plan, people wanting to take climate into consideration. For example, water utility managers want to know how to build for uh, more severe flooding during storm events or if they're in areas of drought, how they can be better at managing water efficiently. And we're hearing this from all sectors, which I think is really encouraging. And we're also seeing a diversity of approaches. So for example, New York is investing in ecosystem restoration. They are helping to rehabilitate areas of Jamaica Bay um, that were heavily degraded because they recognize the important benefits that these habitats provide in buffering uh, the community. And also other communities, for example, uh, this is in Louisiana where you can see the existing bridge is incredibly low lying. And so this is a vulnerability, um, not just due to like long term effects, but if you have a big storm event and you're losing major evacuation corridors, that's really detrimental for your community. And so they're planning a bridge that better tolerates storm surge and is also higher to account for the fact that sea levels are rising. We also have policies that are coming into play um, that the government is advancing. So we have, for the first time ever, a national ocean policy in the United States. This was released in 2010, and it focuses on coasts, oceans, and Great Lakes. And there are a bunch of different priorities under this ocean policy, but one of them is focused squarely on climate change and ocean acidification. And there are more than 15 government agencies that are now actively working, including folks like the Navy, on how we can more sustainably manage our oceans into the future. We also have, as of a year ago, President Obama's Climate Action Plan. And this set out a series of activities on um, cutting carbon pollution, preparing the US for the impacts of climate change, which is the piece that I work on, and leading international efforts recognizing that this is a global problem and we need global solutions and global partnerships. Um, so in November, there was a, an executive order release that, that set out a whole bunch of different activities on climate preparedness. I'd encourage you all to take a look at it. There's really exciting work underway and created a number of new initiatives focused on how we can enhance our resilience to climate change. So in general for the oceans, uh, we have several kinds of keys to success. Uh, one that's important is where possible, avoiding irreversible damages. In some cases, we can reverse the trajectory, and with other issues like species extinction, once you lose a species, it's gone. You're not going to get that back. And so better understanding and avoiding those tipping points beyond which um, there's sort of a point of no return is important if we can make that happen. We also need to manage for resilience. We need to think more holistically um, about how we manage our oceans so that we're collaborating and not adding additional stresses 
protecting biodiversity and habitat, as we heard from our panelists from Conservation International, is a really important strategy. And also with climate change, especially with the impacts on ocean, it, it's not like we can magically buffer the oceans ourselves and prevent ocean acidification from happening. So, But in some areas, uh, certain pollutants can be acidifying. So if we can reduce those pollutants in those areas, for example, then those systems, you know, the pH won't be quite as affected. So we can think about how we might be able to have local solutions that are not even necessarily related to climate change, but have the benefit of enabling that ecosystem to be more resilient. And then also building capacity to implement changes and to develop new knowledge and tools. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's hard to come to a conference like this and hear a lot of bad news. I was actually really psyched that the speaker before me had such optimistic numbers. Um, and I think that, you know, we have to have hope. And I think that's actually one thing that scares me the most is that as people learn about climate change, they often get scared and they disconnect or they feel powerless. And it's really important for people under, to understand that there are solutions available and that we have options and that the sooner we pursue those options, the better. Um, so I take hope in conferences like this and seeing that there is advanced understanding, there's momentum growing at all levels, and that uh, younger generations are really very aware and very literate um, around these issues and our, our great leaders are ready um, on these issues and will continue to be over the coming decades. Um, and thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions if we have time. Um, in terms of fishing and whether it's cyclical or whether it's, you know, declining or going up, I think it just depends on what you're focusing on. So, I mean, good news is, right, if we allow areas to fully recover, they can. Um, in some instances, it depends on what type of species. If you're talking something like cod that takes a really long time to mature to adult size and reproduce, those take way longer to recover than some species that are like smaller and reproduce a lot. And so um, some of that is a timing issue, but part of the problem globally is it tends to be like, as soon as stuff starts recovering, we start harvesting again. And so it depends on, right, um, a lot of this has to do with effective management practices. Um, and again, it's the sort of this issue, uh, folks talk about shifting baselines where like, like, so I was born in 1980, and so what I know as being pristine has already been degraded, right? And what you guys are born into is even more degraded than when I was born, and, and so on and so on. And so what, what we're used to as sort of a natural system is kind of shifting through time. Um, and so, like the question earlier today, is there anywhere that's totally untouched by humans? The answer is no, especially with climate change now. Um, but it's important to remember the historical perspective and to think about, like, to see learn from the past uh, what these environments used to be like that can give us insight into the future. Not that we'll necessarily be able to regain everything like it used to be, that's not realistic in many cases, but it can still provide insight into what a healthy system truly is. So the question was, is ocean acidification a global or local issue? It's a little bit of both. So in general, if you look at the whole ocean, um, the pattern is that it's getting more acidic. But there are some areas where it's getting uh, acidic more quickly, and then there's some local areas where it's really not getting that acidic. And that depends a little bit on like oceans, the patterns of currents and where things move. So for example, uh, off the Pacific Northwest and off the west coast of some of these other continental land masses, uh, the water tends to already be naturally a little bit more acidic due to a process called upwelling, where basically nutrient-rich water is brought up from the deep and it tends to be um, more acidic. And so these areas are a little bit more susceptible where like a small change 
they might actually be able to see that. So in some ways, they're kind of sentinels for what we might expect to see in the future in other areas that aren't currently experiencing ocean acidification. Um, so they're useful to kind of get insight into what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. I don't know if this is like a policy issue um, or if you would know the answer to this, but going back to like the plastic like countries basically like in the ocean, is that something that is like, why, are, why isn't that something that we are acting on, like, right now? Like, is it, like, a money thing? Is it something that, like, that's not someone's territory, so they're, they don't, like, see it as a big problem? I mean, everyone knows that plastics aren't good and the end-all thing. It yeah. doesn't end. Yeah. When they just keep breaking down. So, I don't know. All of our money is going to all these unnecessary things where I feel like that is something that we could clean up right away and see results. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, right? Plastics in the ocean. I would say there are certainly some efforts underway, but they're just not kind of at the scale that's necessary to really fully address the problem. And the system has inputs as soon as we, you know, have outputs. So um, in the U.S., we have, uh, there's a marine debris program at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So there's some actual targeted offices who that's their full-time job is addressing marine pollution. There's some international efforts, NGOs are doing a lot of work, but I do think part of it is the scale of the problem, the locations of the problem, right? Like especially remote areas that are really hard to get to. And some of it is unfortunately budgetary where, you know, if we don't necessarily, this isn't necessarily part of the way. So even when things happen, like when the tsunami happened, people were getting marine debris washing up in all areas. We had some in the US and, you know, there weren't just, financial resources available for communities to be able to go out and physically remove all that debris. So it is partly it's like logistical constraints and then also probably awareness issues. And then how can we better work with coastal communities so that they understand the potential impacts of plastics? Um, I think there's already been a lot of good progress on that front, especially like when I was a kid, you know, people didn't, it was the pictures of sea turtles eating plastic bags and thinking they were jellyfish that made people, including my parents, start to kind of understand what some of the issues were. So I think um, sometimes there's just a lag in the system and our understanding in the way we do business. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, in terms of where the fish are that people like to eat, we as humans have done a pretty good job of finding a lot of those spaces, even when they're really hard to get to. And the other thing is that we're really smart creatures, right? So we've developed technologies that make us able to uh, stay out for longer periods of time and fish deeper. And um, so, you know, but that being said, fishing isn't inherently a bad thing. We need people depend on fish in many areas of the world. It's their primary source of protein. So the question is not if to fish, it's kind of how can we fish in a way that's more sustainable, that reduces um, bycatch, for example, catching stuff that we don't intend to, or, you know, using practices that aren't as destructive to the habitat that those fish depend on. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there's a lot we have left to learn. I think a lot of it probably depends on population and where, what people depend on for their food. But I think also, you know, when we talk about global food security, a lot of people focus on agriculture and that's really important. Um, people don't tend to think as much about fish as food security, but oceans, it's really important to think about oceans when we think about global food security because that is where a lot of people get um, their primary sources of protein. Thanks.